Yeah, so thank you. Good morning. I'm really honored uh, to be addressing uh, this group here. I haven't been that much in this part of the world and it's uh, really nice to, to learn a new uh, community here. And uh, I need to apologize that uh, I don't speak Spanish at all. As a kid, I had a choice between French and Latin. And at least I opted for Latin, so I'm, I'm kind of close to Latin America, but uh, not that close. So um, yeah, I need to do this in uh, English and I hope the simultaneous translation will be uh, good uh, so uh, you will be able to uh, follow me. Um, so during the talk, I will point out a few Spanish speaking people, I hope who are in the audience and uh, uh, who will be able to talk about uh, some aspects as well. Okay, so let, let me start by saying something about uh, uh, myself uh, quickly. So I'm a university professor um, and um, I focus on uh, doing work that actually gets out there, gets deployed, gets on the internet, which is a little bit unusual maybe for a uh, university uh, professor. And if you want to learn more about what, what I'm doing during my daytime, um, I have prepared this little slide for you uh, so you can uh, look up uh, what I have been up to in the last uh, 20 years. But maybe I can summarize this uh, uh, a little bit shorter. What I've been doing uh, for, for more than three decades now is bringing the internet to new applications. And this always works in the following way. Um, you talk to people who are the domain experts and they tell you the application X will never run on the internet. And then you talk some more to them and then you talk some more to them and maybe a decade or two passes and then they ask you um, how do we finally shut off those parts who still aren't on the internet. So this happens again and again and of course this will happen with connected devices. Um, as well. Um, so uh, we have to prepare for this uh, happening. Now the, the Internet of Things is going to be a, a pretty significant event in the development of the uh, Internet uh, because we are getting very different numbers from the ones that, that we are uh, used to. So uh, this is a slide from Ericsson, a company that has been doing uh, work in the phone space um, for about uh, 100 years and uh, they, they mostly have been connecting places. So they have been wiring up places with uh, phones and uh, then they have been doing this for, for 100 years and they noticed, oh, actually what we want to connect are not the places but the people. And uh, of course one uh, point here is there are actually more people than there are places. Uh, so that was a significant uh, increase in numbers. We now all have uh, smartphones and similar things. And uh, what we are experiencing now is that we are going back and actually connecting the things in the places and the things that we carry around with ourselves on, on persons to the network. So this is what gives us a large number of additional nodes that will come up on the network. Now most of you will be pretty familiar with scaling up because the internet has all been about scaling up for, for uh, the last decades. Um, but there is a, one new point here. When you scale up to something like 50 billion nodes or maybe even 200 billion nodes uh, within a few years, at some point you have to understand somebody has to pay for these nodes. These nodes cannot be as expensive as, as the internet nodes are today. So this scaling up experience that you are probably very much used to will also become a scaling down experience because things become so much less expensive. So we are really talking about nodes like this to get on the internet. And this can be manufactured for about uh, uh, 50 cents and uh, maybe in a system you can, can get to a system cost of three dollars and we will have a lot of those. And to be able to do that we have to scale down cost but we also have to scale down complexity because much of the cost 
you get when putting things on the internet actually is about the complexity that is inherent to it. You might also want to relearn a few words that have been come, become a bit out of fashion. Uh, so words like cent, kilobyte, megahertz. These are words that are describing uh, properties of systems that are inexpensive and can be rolled out in large numbers. And just to, to put a number on this, um, we have actually uh, try to classify the, the kinds of systems we will find on the um, internet in, in an uh, RFC recently. And uh, what we are focusing on to make possible is to get nodes with maybe 10 kilobytes of RAM and 100 kilobytes of flash on the internet. So these are very, very inexpensive uh, devices. Of course, the price is, is going down some more continuously. And we, we have been focusing on enabling these nodes. That doesn't mean, of course, that there will be no other nodes. There will be nodes in the Internet of Things that will be thousands of dollars and will uh, consume hundreds of watts. But we also have to make sure that we put these very inexpensive uh, nodes uh, in the Internet of Things. So for those of you who are a little bit older, who remembers this picture? who has worked on a PDP-11 in their lives. Not that many in this uh, audience, or oh, at least one. Um, th this is a computer from the 70s, and what we are do doing is essentially shrinking this down uh, into a constraint node and putting it on the internet. And by the way, it wasn't that easy uh, in uh, 1976 to put this uh, computer on what was the ARPANET the precursor of the internet. Yet. And it's not necessarily easy to put our constraint nodes uh, on the network. And we also have to work with constrained networks. We may not, may not be able to actually run the same kind of network to each of these $3 uh, devices out there uh, because it consumes too much power, it has the wrong spectrum, doesn't have the right reach. Uh, and so on. So we are seeing a number of constrained networks in the Internet of Things space. We are of course also seeing Wi-Fi, Ethernet, it, it's all uh, still there. You just pick from what solves your specific uh, application. But constrained networks are out there and are being put on the Internet. And uh, we may have to think about interconnecting networks in places where we haven't done that before. So for instance, in the home, we may have different kinds of networks in the future, not just your Wi-Fi network. And uh, 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 activities like uh, HomeNet actually work on making these network interconnections possible. Okay, so in the end, what uh, we have been trying to, to do is uh, enabling constrained node networks to be in the internet, in the internet of things. Uh, there are many names for these constrained node networks, uh, like low-power lossy networks, IP smart objects, and so on. I'll stick with Internet of Things uh, here, even though Internet of Things, of course, also includes larger uh, devices. Uh, industrial control systems sometimes will be rather expensive devices, but they also are part of the Internet of Things. So what's the, the common aspect about the Internet of Things? Well, it's the internet protocol. And uh, why do we care about that? Because the internet protocol really is an integration protocol. It's what allows us to put things together that were hard to connect uh, before. Uh, uh, the, the, much of the IP work really has been about reducing barriers. So we have been uh, working on IP telephony for a long time, uh, replacing lots of the, the special telephony hardware by, by standard routers and servers, um, getting several orders of magnitude and cost reduction while doing uh, that. So today it's really easy to place a call from this country to my country, but uh, it was very, very different 20 years ago. Uh, but even may imp uh, more importantly maybe, um, the number of programmers out there who understand what they can do with an internet-based system is so much larger than the number of programmers you get for specialized systems. 
so there are millions of people out there who understand how to program for the web and we want to get these people on board in deploying the Internet of uh, Things. So um, some people, whenever this happened, and this happened, it has happened a few times in, in the history of the Internet, people first talked about convergence, so that there are things that are flowing together, uh, but uh, uh, after not much time it usually turned into conversion. So there is, uh, the old technology is just going away and uh, being replaced by internet-based technology. Now this has served us well for a while, but um, one question that comes up in the Internet of Things again, in particular uh, when you consider the low cost we are uh, uh, targeting at, do we actually need all of the baggage of the Internet to get all these things on, uh, connected? So my toothbrush um, really would benefit from recording my, my toothbrushing sessions and uh, making that available to some health app that I'm already running on my smartphone, but doesn't really have to be able to connect to all of the Internet with all of the existing protocols and complexity uh, and so on. And, and even if we can make that happen, being able to make that happen is not necessarily always a good reason to do it. So I, I can illustrate this a little bit. Of course, you can move a sofa uh, using a, a motorcycle. Um, so you often hear this argument, yes, you can do eggs with existing internet technologies, but sometimes you just don't want to do it. Um, so uh, the, the history of the Internet of Things really has been a, a tussle between two camps. One that said, uh, IP is too expensive for my microcontroller and I have this wonderful hand-knitted protocol that is so much, more expensive, uh, so much more efficient. And on the other side, we have the people who say, well, IP already works for my application, so what, what are we even talking about? And both can be true, but there is something in the middle. And uh, I've, I've tried to illustrate this a little bit here. Um, so when you draw the increasing complexity of, of systems that are on the internet um, on the horizontal axis, um, you have something like a Raspberry Pi maybe or your typical home router system uh, on the right end. So these are great Internet of Things platforms, uh, but they are relatively expensive both with respect to their own manufacturing cost, but also with respect to their energy usage. Um, so the question is, how far to the left can we actually go? And I'm not sure that, that the, the barcode on my Coke bottle will soon be replaced uh, by Internet of Things technology. So this will take some more time. There, there will continue to be applications that are to the left of this uh, barrier here. But there are some applications where we can push technologies down to the microcontroller uh, space and there, there are even some um, technologies where we will be able to use internet technologies um, by uh, adding new protocols, by creating protocols that actually work uh, very efficiently in this space. And much of the work really uh, recently has been about moving this boundary to the left and just adding a little bit of space here. And this may not seem like much space, uh, but since really the, the number of applications you get grows inversely to the cost, uh, just moving the boundary a little bit to the left increases the number of applications you can uh, address uh, very, very quickly. So that's an ongoing process. And when you look at uh, uh, applications that are out there today, uh, you uh, may find, uh, well, they, they are still using IPv4. They spend mo much of their energy on traversing nets. Um, they are all device to cloud kind of um, applications. They are very much gateway based, silo based. Their security is questionable. They are based on platforms that, that usually make the cost of a device uh, about $40 or more. So if you buy a Belkin Wemo switch, for instance, that's a $40 uh, item, and it's not quite clear that, that the switch on an electrical outlet uh, should cost $40. And maybe most importantly, they consume about a watt of energy. 
And that's maybe not a problem if you have one of them, but if you have two of them and 20 of them and maybe 250, which is about the size we, we see for the connected home of the future, then this technology will not cut it. I will not put in 250 watts of energy consuming devices into my home to, to get the benefits of the connected home. That's just too expensive and it's also heating up my home a bit too much. Um, so uh, what we need to get out there is this, I, I call it real IoT, of course, this is, this is also already Internet of Things, but this is really what we're trying to move to. Um, get rid of the IPv4 net issues, uh, really run this as an Internet, so nodes can talk to each other, they don't have to talk to the cloud to make something happen. Uh, we can build mashups of small things, that are loosely joined. We have real security. I'll come back to what I mean with that. Um, and the devices are sufficiently simple that you can actually sell them for less than $5, which means you can manufacture them for a sub-dollar uh, amount. So that's where we are aiming at. And with that comes an energy con consumption in the uh, milliwatt, microwatt uh, area, so you actually can afford to have a number of those. So uh, people have been trying out this, this newfangled Internet of Things, and if you look into the popular press, into the newspapers and so on, uh, most authors are rather skeptical. So after the initial hype, you now find articles like uh, this one from uh, John uh, Norton, you can read the whole text on, on the slide later, but uh, the, the guy was essentially pointing out what he, you can buy today is making your home very insecure. It doesn't really work very well. And uh, we really should be doing uh, this based on sound engineering. We should try to get these systems built by engineers who know what they are doing, like how the internet was built in the 70s and, and uh, uh, 80s. Um, so I think we can help this guy because we have those engineers. Um, and uh, so the next step will be um, getting the, the knowledge out there and getting people to design systems, nodes, but also installations, uh, applications with the knowledge of, of the technology that's uh, actually enabling well-working, secure uh, systems. And that's something that the IETF is trying to do for the uh, Internet, the, the Standards Organization uh, for the uh, Internet. The IETF is a bit of a strange organization because it's not even a legal entity. At some point, the Internet Society had to be founded uh, to, to have some legal entity uh, lawyers can be sent to uh, if something goes wrong somewhere. And uh, the IETF has an amazingly low threshold of getting, uh, to, uh, getting work in there. So we have a few mailing lists and you can just start contributing to the IETF from, from any place uh, in, in the universe. Um, so th that's a, a pretty uh, strange organizations when it comes to, to standards development, but maybe this is exactly what we need because we need to get people from very, very different uh, areas of expertise together in one room. It's not just the telecommunications guys, it's not just the industrial control systems guys, it's not just the uh, home uh, products uh, guys. You, you need to get all these people together uh, and uh, talk about uh, the, the uh, uh, network solutions we need. So the IETF has been doing this uh, for a while now, and uh, the IETF works in working groups. Um, each of these working groups is organized around a mailing list, so if you want to know what's going on in a working group, the first thing you do is you go to that uh, mailing list. And uh, so far we have created nine working groups in the um, IETF for uh, working on the Internet of Things. And um, this has been going on for long enough that two of the working groups are uh, already done. So the two with the green check marks here uh, have already completed their work and the other ones are ongoing. But for instance, COSI down here is close to completing their work as well. That's just the way the IETF works. 
we take a specific problem, we create a working group that works on that specific problem, and when that problem is solved, that working group might uh, close down, or it might be rechartered with new aspects of, of that uh, work. So this has been going on for a while, and uh, this leads to other organizations, for instance, the OCF, the Open Connectivity uh, Forum, uh, to pick up these uh, specifications and build a protocol stack that has significant parts of an IETF stack in it. So for instance, we have an encoding layer that is based on, on an IETF document. Uh, we have a, a web transfer protocol ca called CoWeb that is being used here. We have various security components. Uh, you know about IPv6. Um, so this is uh, the, uh, or one of the um, Internet of Things protocol stacks that are being designed right now by industry uh, groups and uh, you will find IETF components uh, in them. But this doesn't mean the IETF can force you to do this. Uh, the um, consortia really need to find that our standards are good and they want to pick them up. The whole thing actually started more than 10 years ago. So in 2005, uh, we started uh, with a working group called Six Low Pan, which was just trying to get a particular radio uh, on the internet, and specifically on the IPv6 internet, because that radio uh, is very low power, so it makes sense to have it in the, the internet of things. So uh, typically when you get something, a, a new link layer standard on, on the internet, you need to have an encapsulation uh, standard, uh, but we also had to think about those uh, constraintness issues. An IPv6 header is relatively large. Uh, the, the radios that uh, we have in the Internet of Things are relatively constrained, so we had to think about header compression, uh, for instance. And we also had to think a little bit about the network architecture in, in such an environment. So uh, one thing that, that uh, we uh, did here is um, define a form of header compression that uh, works on area state, so you don't have lots of flows setting up state. Uh, you just set up state once, and you can use that to do a header compression. But we also came up with a network architecture uh, for uh, six low pan networks that uh, makes use of less constrained nodes, because at least some of your nodes uh, on an IoT network are going to have power. So you want to be able to transfer activities that, that would normally have been done uh, by the, the end nodes themselves uh, towards these less constrained uh, nodes. So we have an LBR or edge router that runs some specific uh, parts of that. So 6 open has been around. Uh, for a while and has been picked up by, by various uh, industry uh, uh, documents. Um, and um, so, so we, we are starting uh, from uh, there. Uh, Six Low Pan focused on just this one radio, 802.15.4, and we have since moved to supporting Six Low Pan technologies on other radios as well. And actually, the, the, the chart I'm going to show now is pretty busy because there are lots of radios you can uh, choose from, or even uh, wireline technologies that you want to put in the Internet um, of Things. And um, everything that, that's uh, beige yellow here is actually being worked on by the Six Low uh, Working Group, uh, uh, has an RFC now that defines. Um, how to do that. So, for instance, Bluetooth Smart or Bluetooth Low Energy, the decked phone system, uh, Z-Wave, um, well, that may not uh, work very well, but let's see, uh, near-field communication, so putting uh, some, some chip cards on, on the IoT. This is all things being addressed by um, the Six Low Working Group. This doesn't mean that the other technologies are going away. They will continue to be in use, of course, they will be part of the Internet of Things. In particular, Ethernet is interesting when you combine it with power over Ethernet, because it means you can uh, get power to uh, places like, like lighting. Lighting will be on, on Ethernet uh, in the future to a large extent. 
Um, so this will be part of, of uh, the Internet of Things together with uh, these very low cost uh, technologies. So this is the sixth law working group. Is Gabriel Montenegro in the room? Gabriel Montenegro will be talking about that later uh, today, and he does speak Spanish, so uh, maybe you want to uh, talk to him when you uh, want to uh, discuss uh, specifics of that technology. So let, let's move on to the next subject, routing. Um, of course, we already have a lot of routing protocols out there, um, so why create another one? Uh, well, the, the requirements for the Internet of Things are a little bit diff different sometimes. Again, the Internet of Things is a big space, so in many places uh, you will find your existing router pro routing protocols work well. There is even one industry group that decided RIP was exactly the routing protocol they wanted to use in the home. So, sure, that works. But there are other environments, in particular environments, that have more of a data collection topology. Think about smart metering environments or uh, smart city environments, where it's quite useful to have a tree-shaped uh, network out there. And uh, a routing protocol for this uh, space has been um, uh, developed. And the, the basic idea is to build these trees, make sure they are reasonably stable by being able to do local repair on the trees, and then define a way of forwarding packets that doesn't even require each node in the network to know the whole topology. So in the non-storing mode of Ripple, you send things to the root of, of uh, the routing tree, and then it's source routed there down to the uh, network again. So this allows for very small amounts of state in every router, which may be your smoke detector or some, some other uh, device that you really don't want to uh, um, put up. Uh, with a lot of complexity that you don't want to consume a lot of uh, energy. So again, there have been a few technical breakthroughs there as well. So for instance, the trickle mechanism uh, is very interesting. Uh, I talked about trees in the previous slide. Actually, these are not trees because trees always break when, when one branch breaks. And so these are directed, um, destination-oriented, directed acyclic graphs. Um, so you can have multiple parents, and this is what makes them uh, very robust. And again, we try to make use of less constrained nodes. Um, so we have uh, some of the functionality in the root of the directed as acyclic uh, graph, and this again allows for low complexity uh, nodes on the network. So. Um, the, this is be, uh, the work being done by the role working group in the uh, IETF. And uh, just a few minutes ago, I saw one of the chairs of the role working group. Can you stand up and, and wave over there? Stand up. <laughs> okay, so Ines is uh, working group chair of, of the role working group. And again, she does speak Spanish. Uh, uh, so you may want to talk to, to her. Um, OK, so now we can get the packets from A to B in the Internet of Things. But the next, uh, next question is, um, how does the application actually work there? And um, in 2010, uh, 2010, we decided that we uh, wanted to have an application protocol that is also very much oriented towards constrained uh, nodes. You know, most of the work on the Internet today is done in HTTP. So uh, HTTP is an obvious candidate also to be used on the Internet of Things. Uh, but it's a relatively complex uh, protocol, and it's relatively expensive to run uh, on a constrained uh, node. So we came up with a constrained application protocol that essentially takes the existing uh, ideas of HTTP but scales them down to a level of complexity that can be handled by an inter a constrained node. Um, and we also added a discovery mechanism, because in the Internet of Things, you really have to keep the cost of setting up things low. And the cost is low, in particular, if devices actually can already find each other and set themselves up, set relationships between themselves up uh, with a low uh, uh, cost uh, almost automatically. 
You need some security work there, uh, but much of the work can be done automatically. And this is uh, what uh, differs between the web of things and, and the browser web uh, that we're using in other places. So looking at the web, um, th there are three elements that make up the web. We have something like HTML. Well, HTML is for humans, not for things. So th that is not going to help us a lot. Uh, we are working uh, on new data formats here. Um, and that is actually uh, one of the most active areas right now, making sure that we have the data formats uh, for the Internet of Things uh, in place. So the, the semantics of those data formats will be machine-to-machine -machine semantics and not uh, machine-to-human semantics or presentation semantics. Um, so the, the, the second point is, is the uh, UI. And uh, it turns out the UI just works. So you can use that in the Internet of Things just the same, same way it's being used in the web and in web applications. And the third thing, um, I already mentioned it, HTTP, uh, this is really a place where some work was uh, required. Um, so instead of trying to compress HTTP or, or do something which would just have added complexity, uh, we decided to, to start uh, from scratch here, um, like this, and uh, build something that, that is uh, as simple as possible but not simpler. And um, the result was the constraint application protocol. So this, from the point of view of an application programmer, this looks exactly like HTTP. You have your uh, REST uh, operations, get, put, delete, post. You have the media type uh, model uh, and so on. So we uh, avoid most of the complexities of HTTP, but provide the same application programming interface. And we also uh, ported the security over from TLS, SSL TLS, to Datagram TLS, uh, so we can uh, run uh, Coop right on UDP. Uh, Coop has a simple four-byte header and a very simple uh, but still compact options encoding. And finally, we added something we call Observe, which is a simple notification architecture, so you don't have to do another thing uh, for handling events. So this is all. Um, in the Coop protocol. And the point here is that a proxy device can actually proxy between HTTP and uh, Coop without knowing what kind of application is running there. So you don't need to reconfigure or software update your proxy each time you come up with a new application. This is really one of the aspects that allow, allows permissionless innovation uh, on the Internet. Uh, you only have to upgrade your two communication partners if you want to do a new uh, kind of thing. And uh, this is maintained here by uh, the application agnostic proxy uh, concept. So this is all based on REST, representational state transfer. Uh, which is the underlying architecture of the web, even if it's not always followed in all web applications. We got rid of HTTP baggage, um, added observe in the style of REST, not in the style of, of the previous hacks that have been used as notification architectures on the net. And finally, we added the web linking based resource discovery uh, mechanism and, and build a resource directory on top of that. And this is all, also all done. It's uh, being used in um, other standards documents. So for instance, OMA, the Open Mobile Handset Alliance, has something called Lightweight M2M, and Coop is, is part of that. If you want to know more about that, um, there is even a, a website uh, with an overview about it http coap dot technology dot technology is one of these new top level uh, domains and uh, there you can find links to the specifications and to uh, implementations you can use in your uh, project so i quickly talked about uh, security <coughs> we, we know that http can use tls for security 
Um, so what do we do in, in the Internet of Things? Well, one way of doing this is to use DTLS. And um, there, there are some aspects of header compression that come in there to make this really um, efficient. And uh, together with DTLS, you have to select a crypto suite. And we had the luxury of being a little bit in a greenfield situation and being able to uh, choose really, really good crypto with that. So we had used the NIST P2 uh, P256 curve. We used SHA-256. We used AES-128. Uh, so the whole thing has 128-bit security. This would be equivalent to RSA-3072 bits, which is uh, kind of nowhere de deployed, nowhere else deployed on the internet uh, today. Okay, so th this is the gears. This is how the security is done uh, between the nodes uh, in day to day. But of course, you have to set up these uh, nodes, and that's where um, ongoing work is happening, in particular in the area of authorization. So how does a node know that it actually is authorized to talk to another node? Authentication alone doesn't uh, suffice for that. You really need authorization uh, in place uh, so that a node can act in the interests of its owner. Uh, if you suddenly have 200 devices in your physical environment, in your personal environment, you really want to make sure that those devices do uh, what they are supposed to do. And uh, as you know, right now the situation is, is pretty sad. Uh, what what uh, uh, is being called security today is usually just thin perimeter protection. So um, in a typical home, uh, Wi-Fi, anybody who knows the Wi-Fi password has the keys to the kingdom, can access everything. Um, so that's really what we need to change by, by putting in authorization. And that, of course, has to be cryptographically uh, secure. And, and the fun thing is, this, this IoT secure of, to, of today, that doesn't even work for a three-member family. Once you have a kid in the family, you may want to authorize some things. Anyway, so um, one of the take-home slides here, um, if something is not usably secure, it shouldn't really be called the Internet of Things. It's maybe an IoT precursor somewhere. It's, it's, some people are trying to set up the Internet of Things. But really, security and usable security, actually, people, uh, security that people want to use and can use uh, to solve their problems, that is what we need. In 2014, we, we created another working group called uh, ACE, Authentication and Authorization for Constraint Environments. And that is uh, using OAuth technology we have from the big web and uh, trying to scale that down or, and apply uh, to the Internet of Things. And the, the main reason why this is a little bit complicated is that in the Internet of Things, when you have two devices that talk to each other, uh, it may actually turn out they have different owners, different controlling individuals uh, because, well, one, one is mine and the other one is uh, a device that, that a visitor in my house brings. And I have to make sure that I can get security processes going um, that are really easy to use, but that do consider that there are two different individuals uh, involved. And the problem, of course, is these devices uh, may just be too simple to do all that. They may not understand enough of the situation to, to make meaningful uh, decisions. Well, my smartphone knows me pretty well, uh, but uh, a temperature sensor or a light switch in my home might not know my visitor well enough to, to actually uh, make a reasonable security association. So we use the, the same mechanism that has been worked in. <coughs> <coughs> has uh, worked in previous uh, IoT standardization activities, we make use of less constrained nodes. Uh, so uh, we add in a layer of less constrained nodes. Now this is a conceptual picture, so th this may, may actually all be a single device uh, here. 
but conceptually, we add in less constraint nodes and do all the complicated uh, logic up here, uh, like the OAuth transactions that actually authorize someone. And then, once we have done this, the job down here gets really simple, can be done without a big uh, user interface. You don't want to have lots of buttons on your light switch. The light switch should just be switching lights. Um, so uh, this is an important next step to, to make this uh, universal in the inter Internet of Things. Um, now, th this is uh, work at the protocol level. There is probably also uh, a need for some work at uh, the, the um, business model level. So how do we help people setting up secure environments in their homes? And this is actually something that, that is worked on a lot in the research community right now. This is a slide I stole from somebody at uh, Technik University of Munich, uh, which shows an idea of having a secure box in your home that actually controls the communication, maybe based on manufacturer usage descriptions and similar uh, technologies. So this is uh, still being understood. And this is also a way uh, to do market differentiation, to come up with products that, that are uh, interesting to sell in this space. So it, the jury is still out on the question whether individuals will be willing to pay for security. Uh, but at least to a certain extent, th that is already happening uh, today. And uh, just as you probably will be fixing the brakes on your car by an authorized uh, uh, garage, uh, you might in the future want to fix the security on your home network by somebody who uh, knows what they are doing. <clears throat> okay, to finish the, the set of things that we have been working on, I, I said uh, data formats are an interesting uh, question. And uh, you know a lot of uh, web work has been moving from XML to JSON recently. Uh, but both XML and, and JSON have this problem that they are character-based. So they are really text formats, which is fine on, on the big web where you have resources to spare. Uh, but uh, um, if you are on a microcontroller, uh, you are really interested in keeping the complexity of handling the data uh, down. And <clears throat> uh, what we did, we, we essentially took the JSON model, uh, looked at what, what is good there, added binary data ex in, and extensibility, and essentially addressed this uh, question mark here on this slide. So um, the world has been moving from document-oriented to uh, data-oriented description techniques. Um, we have had a concise binary form of XML for a while. That's the XE representation. Uh, but while XE was being defined, everybody was just moving from XML to JSON. So this hasn't really happened uh, very pervasively. And uh, what uh, we filled in was, was this box having a binary data-oriented representation. Formed. And this is based on, on uh, uh, about four decades of work on representation formats. So there, there's actually an RFC, RFC 713, that defines an early representation uh, format from the late 1970s. And uh, it turns out we kind of have become, fu uh, have gone full circle uh, because uh, we now have a format that is approximately as con compact as the one that was used in the late 70s. And maybe given the capabilities of the computers involved, that's not, not a, a surprise. Um, again, there are some, some websites you could be uh, using for looking at this uh, work. Cbor.me allows you to play around uh, with the technology. And Cbor.io is a site that uh, shows specifications. Thank you. And um, this table is inclined. It doesn't have a way to. See what they all allows you to look at the specification and uh, the implementations that, that are available. Okay, so we, we have filled in that slot, and we are now working on a data definition language 
so you don't have to use old technologies like XML schema or JSON schema to uh, work with this. The final activity I would like to list is uh, COSI. Uh, you know what? Oh, thank you. You know what COSI means in Spanish? Um, so this is really about sewing up um, the, the various uh, security uh, schemes we have and making it available in uh, the Internet of Things. It's based on something called Jose, which is the, the JSON web token uh, activity. And we have ported over the, the Jose work, which is pretty well received in the OAuth uh, community. Uh, over to COSI. So we now have a way to do compact binary data structures for uh, security tokens, authorization information, and so on. So by now we have a, a pretty uh, complete set of application layer technologies uh, that we can uh, use. And uh, really right now, uh, most of the activity is in this data formats. Uh, space, but of course the security area also is interesting and se the security issues of course have to interact with the data formats. So if you go up to a coffee machine and want to m wanted to make coffee for you, uh, then you may have to interact some domain data like how much milk do I want in my coffee, but you also may uh, want to make a payment uh, happening and that's definitely a security issue. Okay, so this is uh, um, the same slide with the working groups again. I, I ran through these uh, working groups uh, really quickly, and I think we, have, we will have a little bit of time for uh, questions in a, a minute. Uh, let me just uh, uh, point out that uh, this is work that is uh, being picked up in a number of places, so it's not like uh, we have a million standards to choose from and everybody chooses a different one. Yes, they differ in, in domain-specific uh, things, but uh, for instance, the, the underlying protocols, we have a lot of consensus uh, there right now and, and really need to focus on uh, the um, data models now. So a final little add I want to put in uh, the IETF. Uh, works on well-defined short-term projects and generate specifications for that. But sometimes we also have to do, a, do some longer-term uh, thinking. And uh, therefore, the IETF has a sister organization, the Internet Research Task Force. And this has about a dozen research groups that work on, on areas that need a little bit of a longer-term uh, view. So, for instance, there is one research uh, group that is interested in, in bringing the Internet uh, to hard-to-reach places, like in, in the Amazon jungle or something like that. Um, and, and our research task force is, uh, our research group is about investigating open research issues in the Internet of Things. And I'm telling you this because I really would like to see more Latin American research groups, universities, uh, industrial research groups uh, to participate in that. So if you are interested in research, uh, you may want to talk to me um, after the uh, meeting and find out how we can make progress in the uh, research group, because we need this research in the end to get good specifications uh, for the Internet of Things. Okay, that concludes my overview and uh, I'm ready to take questions. problems with the microphone. Uh, no. Hi. Hi, Carsten. Thank you. Very good presentation. Um, I'm aware that you attend this weekend this W3C meeting with Think to see Research Group. Uh, please, if you can share with us the takeaways of the meeting. It would be nice. Which, which is your experience? But if there is some takeaway. <laughs> the room 
loudspeakers are meant to, to talk to you, not to me. I cannot really hear you. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. Very good. Um, I am aware that you attend this weekend this W3C meeting with Things to Sins Research Group. And I would like to know, please, if you can share with us the takeaways of the meeting. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so th there are a number of organizations working in this space. And one of the organizations that um, also wants to, to uh, be in on the Internet of Things is the W3C, the uh, World Wide Web Consortium, which is doing things uh, like the HTML uh, standard and the browser-based APIs that, that uh, are so important for moving the web uh, forward. So they have decided to start an activity called the Web of Things Interest Group, or WOT, what uh, interest group. And this interest group has been meeting in, in a pre-establishment form for a while now and is in the final throes of being uh, becoming a chartered uh, interest group plus also a chartered uh, working group. And what they mainly want to do is provide something they call a thing description, uh, which is a, a document that a small node can export, either by, by just making it available over co-op, or just maybe pointing to a web resource where that document can be downloaded. And that thing description will tell other things, or maybe your smartphone or your home gateway or whatever, what that thing is able to do. So if it's a temperature sensor, it's going to tell you uh, what form of temperature it supports. Is it Celsius or Fahrenheit or Kelvin or uh, whatever? And what operations can you do on that device? So with a door lock, you need to know, yes, I can open the door and close it again. With a coffee machine, you need to know I can make coffee with it. Um, and so on. So the, the, thing, the thing description will provide a way to find out what an Internet of Things device can do so other devices can start talking uh, to it without humans having to do all the configuration work. And uh, the other thing uh, that W3C also wants to do is define a scripting API so uh, you uh, get a way in, for instance, a browser application uh, to actually talk to different Internet of Things devices that may be available within the environment where the browser uh, runs. And you can mesh up these things to provide some functionality. So you might be able, for instance, to uh, combine some music source with uh, an algorithm that uh, uh, creates li a light scene out of that, um, and so on. So, thing description and uh, scripting API are the two parts that are currently being uh, defined. And um, after the W3C uh, meeting uh, last week in Lisbon, now the um, W3C process for creating a working group becomes active. And in January or February, there will be actual meetings of uh, that working group. And W3C is not quite as open as IETF, but there is still a mailing list, uh, so you can go to the public-wot uh, uh, mailing list and uh, actually see what they are doing and uh, contribute to that activity as well. And I probably should add that at the end of the W3C meeting, we had a, a quick meeting of the research group just the last weekend, uh, so uh, uh, the day before yesterday, and Saturday, and we picked up some of the issues about data formats and uh, uh, provided some more details. And a typical research group thing then is to, to help in running workshops about that. So there will be a workshop, for instance, at the start of November, uh, uh, taking up semantic interoperability of Internet of Things devices. Hi, uh, my name is Carlos uh, Soy de Lagnic. Uh, first of all, Karsten, I would like to thank you for having accepted our invitation on behalf of all our community. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, my question is, um, where do you see a way out of the, the economic cycle of manufacturing uh, cheaper and cheaper devices 
while sacrificing functionality, thinking specifically about security. Um, there have been some analysis pointing out that the Internet of Things is caught in a sort of a dangerous economic cycle, a race to the bottom. I would like to, to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. That, that's a very good question. And um, th there are actually economists and social scientists working on some aspect of that. And it's really important to, to talk to those researchers to find out uh, what's going on. So in, in the research group, we, for instance, we just had a discussion of uh, a paper that somebody wrote about the, the willingness of people to pay for security. Um, but um, th there are parts of the industry where actually this downward spiral is not happening. People are not buying cheaper and cheaper and less secure cars, for instance. Cars have increased their security over the last uh, decade. And uh, part of that, uh, obviously, is that, that people perceive the risk of cars because they, they meet people who have been in accidents and, and they, they wear some, some devices because they have been in accidents and it's very visible. Uh, so that, that's one aspect. Uh, but the other aspect also is regulation. Uh, so the, the car environment, because it's so safety critical, have, has been heavily regulated. I'm not saying that we should have the same kind of heavy regulation in the Internet of Things, uh, but I think there is some space for having rules uh, that enable IoT devices. Uh, so for instance, it would be nice if uh, the, the various authorities wouldn't just check that, that the radio emissions from a device are OK, uh, but uh, maybe they could also check whether the device can be updated when there is a security problem, and whether the manufacturer has a scheme in place for actually coming up with these updates. So these are questions that I think should go to the regulators. And apart from that, we just have to make sure that you can make them secure in the first place, and we don't run into a place where it's just too hard to do the security. Good morning, Marta Fonseca from the team of the, this stream. They are asking about security problems related with cars without drivers and the uh, way they are working in this kind of security issues. Security problems, but I didn't get the, the middle part. Sorry. The, the cars, the vehicles yes. without drivers. Yeah, so the, the, the cars are pretty interesting because they, they are a little bit of a prototype for the, the IoT environments you will get. A car already is an IoT environment in a certain sense because there, there are several dozen or even several hundred of processors in the car that each solve a specific uh, problem. So when somebody from the outside manages to take over one of those processors, you might have a cascading effect uh, where taking over one processor opens a hole for taking over another processor and so on. Uh, that's something that car manufacturers in, in, in the uh, history haven't really thought about very much. They haven't been thinking about cars as internet environments because, of course, they did everything in their power to make cars a very controlled and very regulated uh, environment. Uh, so I think we can learn a lot uh, from the ways uh, cars uh, have been hijacked uh, in, in security environments. But we also simply have to apply the same technology. So we have to think, for instance, about better ways to do software updates of cars. Now, I have been in a Tesla Roadster uh, a couple of years ago uh, that was on a highway uh, in, in the passing lane and was rebooting while we were doing that. That's very scary. You don't want that to happen with your car while you are uh, overtaking another car. Uh, but we, we need ways uh, for these devices to get updates, to get better uh, software, to get better configurations uh, while they are part of our lives. Um, so this is one area where we actually had a workshop in, in June uh, in Dublin and, and discussed how can we do uh, software updates. So I think if you ask your car dealer about software updates, they are going to come back with a blank stare 
but it, it's a subject that will come up more and more. Hi, Carsten. Uh, another question. Uh, to get the semantic interoperability in, in IoT, uh, what do you think they are the bottlenecks? I mean, I would say the different standards, but uh, in your personal opinion, which are the bottlenecks for, to get the semantic interoperability or the challenge, the current challenge? Well, the, thank the, you. Thank you. Um, what are the bottlenecks? Um, I think it becomes pretty apparent what the bottlenecks are when you just try to do something in the Internet of Things. Because you will notice the devices don't understand the data they, they should be exchanging. This is one bottleneck. And the other one is, I don't know how to set up the security in such a way between the devices uh, that they can do the task I would like to give them. So it, it's a relatively basic thing. I, I go out there, I want to find a device that solves a specific problem. I probably can find such a device now. We are actually advanced enough to do that, but I still cannot really connect it. I mean, I can put it on the internet, but I still cannot connect it with the other devices that it would need to connect to. Um, so this is really something we need to work on. Uh, obviously, there are also some, some matters in, in getting the networking uh, really work well with a large number of devices. So I come from a country where, where IPv6 is now pretty much rolled out. So uh, there isn't really a big obstacle to, to getting something running on IPv6. But that's very different in different countries. Uh, so that's one other bottleneck that we have to work on. Bien, ¿alguien tiene alguna otra consulta? ¿Alguna otra pregunta para Carsten? Si For no. Carsten. If there are none, then uh, we'll close the session. Apparently. Ah, tengo un aparato de traducción, así que pueden hacer la pregunta en español si quieren. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. It's rather a comment, not a question. Oh, she's speaking English. Traductor, oh. mejor. Más un comentario. This is rather a comment. You said that IETF is uh, highly involved in IoT, and also in Jeff, uh, there's a dynamic uh, coalition of, uh, that already went to Mexico in December. I'd like to know, are there any regional issues? You mentioned devices that won't communicate and other issues related to the vendors, to the manufacturers, but I think that there may be regional issues. What is accepted in Latin America for IoT, for instance, for cars, may not be the same as for the United States. How is that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's uh, a pretty big question. Um, th there are lots of regional issues coming in. Well, first of all, the Internet of Things is, is a global phenomenon. But to make a specific product work in a specific environment, it really has to work with what's expected in that environment. So for instance, I come from Germany. Germany has a pretty checkered history. And uh, we, have, we are pretty cognizant of privacy issues. So for instance, a device that, that uh, is to be accepted in Germany has to have reasonable privacy properties. So for instance, uh, about 10 years ago, people tried to put RFID systems into retail operations in Germany, and it just died because people were thinking about RFID privacy issues, and the manufacturers didn't have the answers at the time. Well, they probably do now, but at the time they didn't. And the, the whole public opinion went very much against that. 
And we, we are a bit in a danger uh, with the Internet of Things uh, here as well. So privacy would be a regional uh, German aspect. There are some areas where it's not easy to get on the Internet um, because it's still too expensive, uh, because there are, um, there are Internet connections, but they are not 24 by 7. Um, or also, for instance, in China, because it, it, access is heavily regulated and tends to break in, in hard to predict ways uh, all the time. So um, solutions that are being developed to work in, in those places will need to take uh, those considerations into account. Um, and of course, the, um, the, there are regional preferences. For instance, in, in the US, everybody has an iPhone. In Germany, everybody has an Android phone. So I have to make sure I understand what these, these devices differ in and how they could be talking to my uh, Internet of Things device. So it's, in part, it's really, is the business model you need for introducing your device actually working in your space? That's not something we can do on the protocol specification level, but we can try to make sure we can work with limited connectivity, we can try to, to make sure we can work with regulated connectivity, and that's something we need to work on. Hola. Mucho gusto, mucho eh, bienvenido a Costa Rica. Yo tengo una pregunta y, bueno, yo estuve trabajando con una empresa. I, I am working for a consortium on the Internet of Things. Estamos. No sé si lo he escuchado. ThingWorks, and we designed a project for agriculture with the Internet of Things and monitoring, control, and we also integrated artificial technology with Watson. We wanted to apply this to a real-life uh, greenhouse under real-life conditions. We had a problem regarding connectivity, so we opted to use Zigbee for connecting all the sensors. I would like you to tell me a bit more about the products with Zigbee, which you mentioned right at the beginning of your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Um, Muchas gracias. Zigbee is, is one of the uh, older full-stack solutions that is not really oriented towards connecting things to the Internet. So Zigbee has a radio in it, the 802.15.4 radio, which actually was the first one uh, th where we uh, defined how to do IP on top of it. So if your devices have a Zigbee radio in it and you can control the software running on them, you can just use SIGSLOPAN to talk to those devices. But if, if they are complete Zigbee devices, then you will need a gateway at some point that connects it to other Internet of Things uh, environments. So th th there are lots of technologies out there that still require gateways like Zigbee or in the wired space there are things like Connex and, and so on, BACnet, um, that, that you want to uh, talk to right now through gateways. Not sure that answers the question, but maybe we can talk a bit afterwards. I, I, I like to make not a question but a comment. Quisiera hacer un comentario y no una pregunta a la auditoria. I would like to say that Carson spoke a lot about IETF. Are you familiar with what IETF is? So I urge you to visit the website and see what IETF does so that you understand what the interoperability is about so that devices can speak with one another. So in Internet, everything speaks with one another. So this has to be replicated. We have a list IETF LAC, which is to have conversations in IETF in Spanish, and you're also welcome to join that list. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Carlos, for that comment. Uh, th this morning at the breakfast, we had a conversation about uh, how, how some people at the table were looking at the IETF as this distant entity that, that is really hard to approach. And, and when they finally did that, they noticed it's not at all hard to approach. Well, we may have a language barrier, but we can work around 
uh, language barrier. So that, that's not a problem. And uh, the IETF is very, very interested in getting opportunities, in particular from, from communities that haven't had their specific issues heard very much yet. So I would really like to encourage you to, to talk to Ines uh, uh, Gabriel, who will come in later, uh, or to me, um, if you have an idea of what should be put into standardization and how we can make sure that, that your view is heard in the IETF. Thank you very much. Hola. ¿Cómo estás? Eh, Hi, I'm from Bolivia. There are many companies in Asia, mostly, and many in my country who are offering solutions of smart cities to the municipalities. What would you recommend, seeing that standardization is still advancing investments? What protocols or what are your recommendations in this context? Thank you. So. Smart cities are, are an interesting area um, because it's something that, that the internet really can do well. It's not something like a car which you buy in 2016 and, and then you use it pretty much in the same structure until it breaks down and you buy the next car. A smart city really has to evolve. So evolution, evolvability is, is the major point about deploying a smart city solution. So I don't have a specific recommendation for, for a product uh, here, uh, but I would like to point out that, that any smart city plan uh, needs to plan for the unknown. You don't know yet what you want to do with your smart city in three, five, eight years from now. You don't know what technologies become available. So you have to make sure that the things that, that you put into your smart city uh, can evolve uh, with the technologies and with your requirements, and that rules out uh, systems that are too tightly knit, that, that are too optimized for just one specific uh, purpose. Now, in some areas, you, you may want to do this if you are checking on the integrity of a bridge, uh, then maybe that's something that, that doesn't get new requirements that often. Uh, but in, in other areas, when you deploy sensors, think about how can I make the, the sensor data that, that uh, um, is provided useful for other things that may uh, come up in the future. And of course, the smart city always also is a political project because cities are political uh, entities, so there are a lot of con considerations on the political level, but I'll try to stick to the technical level right now. Okay. Last chance to ask a question in the big room, but you can always come up to me later. Thank you very much.